Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our elephant professional lecture um, here in from the Golden Triangle Asian Elephant Foundation here in far north Thailand. Um, Today we have a, a subject that's very, very close to my heart, um, which is the foraging ecology of semi-free roaming Asian elephants in Northern Thailand. Those of you who've been following the lockdown live streams, which we've been doing here since, uh, since March 27th, uh, since COVID, uh, COVID changed the world, if you like, um, will know that it's been fascinating me as I've been following the elephants around for two hours a day, um, to see exactly, and it's a revelation to me, in fact, uh, even though I've been hanging around with elephants since 1999, the sheer variation of what they eat when you're, when you're, when you're watching them. Um, and I've commented on it many times and said, oh, somebody should do a study on this. Um, and then a few months ago in the, the journal of the Asian Elephant Specialist Group, Gaja, somebody had done a study on it. And this is from up in the mountains in Mechem, I believe, above Chiang Mai, um, Kindred Spirit Elephant Sanctuary, who are, are a, a lovely place to go and visit. Probably a little bit cold today, I guess. Colder than us, I'm sitting in lovely sunshine. I see Kerry has her scarf on. Um, but a, a lovely place to go and visit if you have the chance. I, I love the mountains up there. Um, and they have done over the last several months or previous, prior to publication, they've actually done the study that I was, I was hoping to do ourselves um, and have, have had it published and will tell us all about it. So uh, without further ado, I will hand you over to Kerry and Aislinn um, who are I don't know if they're both in nature, but they're spread out across the world, and um, they will they will tell you tell us all about it and how, how they studied and, and whether we can replicate here, please. Okay, over to you, Kerry. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our presentation. I just apologize in advance if you hear any background noise because I'm currently finding signal in a field hut, and some of the villagers are out here working in their fields, so just bear with me. Um, so our presentation today is foraging ecology of semi-free roaming Asian elephants in northern Thailand. So this study was first set up by our research staff Talia Gale in 2016 and the data was collected by research interns between um, 2016 and 2020 and was written up by Carly Swartz and Alex Stronkola last year. So first of all just some background into what we are and who we and what we do. So we are a nonprofit foundation that was first started by myself and my Thai Korean husband Sombat in May 2016. We work very closely with the local communities here in our area to bring their elephants home to the forest. Our main goals include providing as natural a life as possible for our elephants by setting up an area with enough food and forest to supply their needs. And due to deforestation in Thailand, this unfortunately is not a very easy feat so we also support our um, community by providing alternative livelihoods through jobs such as homestays, driving, cooking, building, and opening markets for the local women to sell their woven goods. We collect data on the elephant's natural behavior, which of course is the purpose of this presentation. And we also have many community projects such as teaching English at the local school in the village, educating on waste management and also conservation. So just a little bit more about our research side of things. So we do have several research projects that we are continually collecting data on. These include, but aren't limited to elephant association, elephant behavior, foraging and elephant sleep patterns. So the focus today is on our foraging research. So why are we collecting this data? So um, it is very difficult to collect data on Asian elephants for a couple of reasons. So it's difficult to observe elephants in the wild due to low population density and also per visibility. And it's also difficult to collect data on natural behavior on elephants in captivity due to deforestation and also lack of access to forest in many areas. So our semi-wild herd provide an adequate environment to study them and their behavior. So this is kind of why this idea was born. And also there's just not a lot of information out there about the Asian elephant and especially on the foraging habitats of it. So first of all, um, just to go into a bit of detail about what we mean about semi-free roaming elephants. So the elephants have a free choice of foraging, behavioral and association as they please with a few restrictions such as agricultural fields, which is seasonally roads and villages, and they each have mahouts who will follow them whilst free roaming and ensure that they are roaming safely. So 
So meet our study subjects, which are our five elephants. So we have observed these five elephants to collect our foraging data. They had all previously been working in the tourism industry prior to um, joining us at KSES. So first of all, we'll start off with Tume. She has been with us since the very beginning in 2016. She is the oldest and the matriarch of the herd. She is 60 years old and previously worked in logging before tourism. So she knows the most about the forest and is very much the leader of the other elephants. Next, we have Mei Doom, who is the daughter of Tume. She is 27 and is also very confident in the forest. Um, she follows her mother around a lot and has learned a lot from her throughout the years. And she has also been with us since the very beginning. Next, we have Dodo. He joined us in 2018. He is 16 years old and is the nephew of Mei Doom and the grandson of Tume. He took a little bit of adjusting um, when he first joined us at KSCS to get used to being in the forest, but now he is very confident and often wandering off on his own. Next, we have Gentong, who is the brother of Dodo. Gentong is eight years old and he used to be very dependent on the other elephants when he first joined us. And um, he required a lot of help, but recently he has also started to find more confidence to forage alone. And he has also been with us since the very beginning. And finally, we have Boonrat, who is unrelated to the other elephants, but he gets along with them very well, thankfully. He is also 16 years old and has become a very confident, mature bull, and has also been with us since our very beginning as well. So I'll now hand over to Aisling, who will tell us a bit more about the science side of things. Okay, so I hope everybody can hear me. Um, hello, my name is Iceline. I'm just gonna go over all the sci scientific stuff that um, Carrie was mentioning about. So what, who, where, and when? So an observation of foraging behaviors of five semi-free roaming elephants in Thailand took place between December 2016 to October 2019. 165 amount of plant species were consumed, representing 56 families. Bamboo accounted for 40.3% of elephant foraging time. Elephants spend more time browsing than grazing. However, an increase in grazing was noted during the cold season, which may be attributed to the access of cultivated fields. Okay. So what is our objective? So the objective of this study were to document the main Folger species of semi-free roaming elephants in a mixed use landscape in Northern Thailand and to identify the seasonal changes in consumption. Okay, so our materials and methods. So our study site um, took place in Northern Thailand, located 180 kilometers southwest of Chiang Mai in the Maichem district. Um, Kindred Spirits is located in a small village of the Karin Hill tribe known by its locals as Bang Naklang, encompassing 4,000 HA of land, including agricultural fields, old growth forest, and secessional forest. As you can see, we had um, different types of ecosystems of mountain tropical ecosystems, as you can see below. We also had three different seasons. We had a cold, dry season from November through February, a hot, dry season from March through June, and the wet season from July to October. It's worth noting that elephants had free choice to forage and associate and behave, but restrictions were placed to protect the agricultural fields. However, land restrictions were relaxed after harvesting season, allowing the elephants to access the agricultural fields in the cold season. Other exceptions are during the cold season where the food was not readily available and mahouts had to provide grass to supplement the elephant's diet. As we move on for the data collection, um, the data of collection started from December 2016 to October, 9, 20, of October of 2019, as previously stated before. Our method of collection was focal sampling and um, 
It was used to collect data from four elephants with the addition of the fifth elephant in October of 2018. The focal sampling, meaning an individual was observed over a period of time with a pre-established intervals. So our intervals included an hour and 30 minutes of, of viewing time commencing at 9 a.m. to 10, 10 a.m., excuse me. Um, it is important to know that observation times varied depending on the location of the elephants, meaning how far or close they were to the village. So for the observation, the observer focused on a single elephant at a time in conjunction with the help of a mahout to identify a plant in local language. As you can see on the right hand side of my screen, I have two pictures. So what would happen is an elephant would finish foraging on a particular plant species, move on, which allowed the observer to come in close, acquire a sample, snap a, cu a, a quick cube, I'm sorry, snap a cube, I'm cute. I'm sure they're cute. It will snap a picture of the samples created and then we would bring it back to base and we would send it out to a botanist in Chiang Mai. That way we would create a database for the food plants that the elephants were consuming. So categorizing. So we um, categorize them into functional groups. So our functional groups included trees, shrubs, herbs, grasses, and climbers. Of those, we divided into browse and graze. Browse included trees, shrubs, herbs, climbers, and bamboo, and graze included grasses. From there, we also divided into parts of the plant that was consumed, there being bark, fruit, leaf, twig, stem, and whole, meaning whole plant. I'd like to point out that although bamboo is botanically categorized as grass due to its growth characteristics and for the purpose of our study with conjunction of previous studies, it would be placed under browsing. For tests, we did a two-way Z test with a significant level of 0 0.05, which would test the seasonal differences in the time grazing and browsing. A one-way ANOVA was also used for the differences in foraging behaviors in three of the seasons of the different functional groups. And finally, a turkey on a significant difference um, test would be used to com compare differences in types of plants consumed between the seasons. Okay. Sorry, our internet's being a little spotty here. But as you can see, um, although it's the video is not loading, um, what we can see is that we have three different elephants and this is what a typical day um, on the field look like. Um, an observer would pick one of the elephants and with conjunction with the help of the mahouts um, would look at a certain elephant and would keep a stopwatch. Um, as soon as the elephant was done um, eating or browsing a particular plant, the stopwatch would be clocked out. Um, and then this is how a particular day um, occurred. I don't know why it's not loading. Oh, there we go. So pretty cool place to be working, I'd say. Heard um, that was probably some communication uh, between the mahouts or between an observer and the mahout because um, we had to have that constant communication in order to be clearly identifying um, the types of plants that were being consumed or the part of the plant that was being consumed um, and such things. Okay, so moving on to our results. Um, so we observed the total time observed was 17,912 minutes. And then um, from December 2016 to October of 2019, we also did seasonal times, which included the minutes observed in each season. So our cold season coming in at 4,541, our hot season at 5,337, our wet season at 8,129. Um, from plant species identified, 165 species were identified from 56 families. Um, directly observed were 155 species. I'd like to add on that 10 species were identified by our mahouts. And then unfortunately, we did have some non-identified species, um, 24 samples to be exact, of those including one climber, two grasses, one shrub, 19 trees, and one herb. 
So as you can take a look at the screen again for me, on the right hand side, we'd see the different changes in seasons. So we have the cold, hot, and wet season. As you can see, they're all very distinctly different. Um, and so it, you can see like what we were working in the current seasons. You can see what, some of them have more um, grass, some of them have more um, types of browsing and stuff like that. Okay. So if you take a look at the screen again for me, at the very top of the screen, you'll notice our chart, um, which just suggests the, the figure two. It says a time spent browsing and grazing during the year and seasonally. As we can see, grazing um, was far more superior than, um, excuse me, browsing was far more superior um, than grazing. As you can see, it's divided into three parts, one being our cold, hot, and wet season. Our cold coming in at a little over 70%, our hot coming in at 90%, and our wet coming in a little over 90%. So as we move along, we have consumed percentages of the 165 species consumed, so which one were our favorites? So we have trees coming in at 49.1%, climbers at 21.2%, Grasses at 12.1%, shrubs at 10.3%, herbs at 6.1%, and bamboo at 1.2%. I like to note that even though um, bamboo is represented at only a 1.2% um, of their diet, 44% of the time was spent consuming bamboo. So that's a pretty significant amount of time spent on it. And then as we move along to time percentages, we have the time spent on feeding in a particular species. So as we look, we have trees at 29.1%, climbers at 12.4%, grasses at 12.4%, and shrubs at 1.4%, and finally herbs at 0.8%. I'd like to note um, that we did also have some crops included in here of those being corn, grass, banana, and excuse me, um, rice. So it's important to know that the crop consumption was left over from the harvest season and was used to supplement elephants diet in the cold season. Not at all, no crop rating occurred here. Um, and then elephants had limited access to the corn and rice fields post harvesting season. Okay. So then we move on to the parts of the plants consumed. And of course, they varied between functional group. So we have trees. We have our leaves coming in at 80%. I'd like to note that most commonly consumed were our leaves at 80%. So if only one part of the plant was consumed, that being 31%, elephants most commonly chose leaves out of the 68% of tree species. Moving on to bark, which we have 47%, which was consumed one out of three species. Moving on to our stems, 49, our twigs, 41, our fruits, 5%, and then our whole plant at 12. I'd like to note that one of each species of our stem, twigs, and fruits were consumed. Um, and then obviously our whole plant coming in at 12%. So we move on to our climbers. Again, I'd like to point out that our leaves are again at the um, highest one here, 80%. And then we have our stems at 74, our whole plant at 26, twigs at 11% bark at 9%, and then one fruit at 3%. And it it's worth noting that 20% of the climber species, only one part was consumed. And then 46% of the time, two parts were consumed, three parts were consumed for a total of 20%, and four more parts were consumed for a total of 14%. As we move along to our shrubs, we see that leaves are coming again high at 53%, whole plant at 35, twig stems at 24, roots at 18, and then one fruit at 6%. I'd like to point out again, um, from the shrubs, 47% were fed selectively for one part, 12% for two parts, 12% for three or more parts, and then 29% for four or more parts. And then we move on to bamboo, which we're looking at the whole plant at 100% consumption. I'd like to point out that leaves, twigs, stems, shoots were also selected for 100% um, as well. As we move on to our herbs, we have our whole plant at 70%, our leaves at 50%, and our stems 
at 30%. And finally, but certainly not least, we have our grasses, which are our whole plant 100%. I think the key um, thing to take away from this is that leaves are coming in um, high in most of the functional groups, that being trees, climbs, climbers, and shrubs. And although not the highest in our herbs, they are definitely at 50%. So it is clear to know um, which one were our favorites in these. Okay. And then um, as we move on to our results here, we have um, um, the graph here at the right hand side. So if you take a look at the graph for me, it is evident that the evidence that the elephants spent a significant more time feeding browse, which include our trees, our shrubs, our herbs, our climbers, and our bamboo, then grazing, which include our grasses um, year round. So our time consuming browse species, when our, our cold season coming in at 73% with a Z value of 44.548, our wet season coming in at 94% with our C value of 111.159, our hot season at 90% and our Z coming in at 83.189. And then we look at bamboo consumption with our cold season with an F value of 4.79, our P value of 0 0.038, our wet season with an F value of 1.06 and a p-value of 0.034, our hot season of f-value being 3.12 and our p-value of 0.128. It's worth noting that there is no significant difference in the time consumed consuming climbers, herbs, and shrubs or trees between the season, but I also like to point out that um, um, elephants spent um, more time eating grasses in the cold season than they did in the hot due to the accessibility of post harvesting fields. So um, bear with me, we're almost done with results. I know this is kind of the hardest part. Um, let's keep going. All right, so we have our discussion. So in previous studies, such as the ones done in Nepal, there was 57 species of plants found from 25 families. West Bengal, India, 67 species from 27 families. And Myanmar, at 124 species with 27 families. I like to, just a few reminder out there, our study um, had a total of 165 plant species from 56 families. As we move on to selective feeding, out of 165 plant species, six species accounted for 64% of our foraging time, um, which is consistent of the studies done in India and in Myanmar. So that's pretty good to see, right? Now we move on to our essentials. So it's important, so I put bamboo and bark, um, but I'd like to point out that it's important to bear in mind that elephants need to consume 10% of their body weight in fresh biomass in order to sustain themselves. And bamboo being so easily available and consumable folder, it provides, it provides just that. Leaving the remaining part of their diet for consumption of essential nutrients such as bark, which can be a time intensive species. So bark, although it is a time intensive species, such as it takes quite a long time for it for, to acquire in order for consumption, it is um, high, it's important and it has important minerals such as calcium, which um, is very important for the elephants. So I'd like to point out that despite the access to seemingly accessible folders such as the bamboo as we see, um, elephants will still spend time and energy to consume selected plants for their nutritional value, such as we see of the, uh, like the bark that they, um, they are making sure that they are getting that bark intake. So in our study, 44% of the time was spent with the consumption of boo, which, bamboo, which is similar to the study in Miramar, which consisted of 57% um, and 85% at two sites. However, location is everything. In, um, in other studies in southern India, only three out of five sites consume bamboo. And then in China, um, bamboo accounted only for 4.5% of their diet. Um, also, so it's important to know that availability of bamboo is dependent on geographic area. So bamboo is a variable of elephant's diet um, according to availability in certain regions. Our findings differ from the study in India where grasses compromise the majority of elephant's diet. However, our findings are similar to the findings in China where although bamboo was low in percentage, it, all, it accounted for a large portion of the elephant's diet.
I'm sorry. Um, I just want to make sure that browsing um, bamboo is low in the percentage, um, but browsing species accounted for a large portion of their of the elephant side, which is what we see as well. I just want to make that clear um, clarification. And then finally, um, I think I've bored you guys all enough. Um, we have our seasonal patterns. So during the wet season, bamboo was consumed more in the cold season. During our cold season, an increase in grass consumption um, was eaten, um, was seen. And it's likely that the increase in grass is related to the access of agricultural fields post-harvesting, including the accessibility to corn and rice that was, a, that was um, restricted during the wet and hot seasons. A similar study done in Sri Lanka um, found a similar pattern at which certain fields were cultivated seasonally, allowing wild elephants to be able to feed on post-harvesting fields for a brief intervals, which may indicate that grazing in regards to grass is a transit folder in the elephant's diet. So it just in conclusion, um, elephants may vary in the use of grass and browse geographically, possibly due to the difference in availability. Nevertheless, um, the elephants in our study um, demonstrated a year round preference for browse over graze. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Kerry, do you have anything to add at this stage? No, nothing to add. I think it all went very well. Yeah, perfect. Um, bamboo fascinates me um, because we have uh, one of our previous elephant professional lecturers, um, Andy Merck and uh, uh, Nani, uh, study wild elephants in in Kauai, and they were talking about uh, about setting up bamboo as a as a um, as a fence to try and keep the wild elephants out of crops, and we. We said, well, that sounds insane. Elephants here eat bamboo. And he, he swears the elephants in Khao Yai do not eat bamboo, wild elephants. And yet across in Salak Pra, um, where we have another project with some camera traps in the forest, um, elephants love the bamboo and are, are eating it all the time. So I think your point of uh, location is everything is, uh, is very, very important. Um, uh, also, I would say I'd love to do a similar study here, and we, we really should because we have a, a, a very similar setup, but on a on a different area of land. So we don't have so many trees, but we have a lot of different grass species. So from my general observation, I would think we would find more more grasses being eaten. But um, fascinating to see, and I think what it really underlines is is that elephants in captivity need access to their natural habitat to be able to to take even. Even once, a, even if it's once a year or something, one of those 165 plant species. Um, one of my questions for you, though, was: Did you ever see the elephants eating roots? Um, just over the past few weeks, as it got very dry around here, we started to see during the wet season. We saw it from time to time: elephants deliberately pulling up um, some shrubs and some grasses, and preferentially just eating the root and and leaving the rest. Um, but when it got really dry, and luckily we've had some rain now, but when it got really dry about uh, up until three days ago, the elephants seem to be preferentially choosing roots a lot. Did, did you see any of that? Yeah, so our elephants do eat roots from time to time. Like you said, it's definitely a lot more during the drier seasons and the wet seasons because the wet seasons they seem to concentrate a lot more on the bamboo. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting to see that it's not very common, but it does happen and the elephants will use their tusks or their tushes to like dig into the ground to uplift the roots so they can eat them. So it's a very cool thing to see. Our uh, roots, I beg your yeah. pardon, I, I should have been paying more attention. Uh, yes, yeah. they... Um... Yeah, so in shrubs, like as we can see, um, roots were at 18%. Um, so just like Carrie said, it's just depending on the seasons that they were um, consuming certain types um, or parts of the plants, yeah. And so we just as an aside, and we'll go back to, to, to other questions later. Uh, one of our elephants, we've, we've taken in three elephants since COVID um, when, when other camps closed down. And one of our elephants came in with a technique that was able to pull up the roots where she'd wrap her trunk around and then grab it in her teeth and pull it up. And we hadn't seen that technique before. And now completely away from, your, uh, from, from this study, so I shouldn't be talking about it. But now all the other elephants or the vast majority of the other elephants have picked up that technique and they're they're uprooting all of our shrubs, which is, um, well, they need to do it. They need to eat. That's what we're here for. Okay, um, there are several people on the Zoom. Would you like to unmute yourselves and ask a question? 
if not, I'll go across. None of my team appear to be here because today, so I'll try and answer the. I'll try and see if there are any questions on the Facebook. Um, from twenty-five families, West Bengal, India, sixty-seven Zoom species guests. from twenty-seven families. And like to unmute yourselves and ask a question. If not, I'll go across. None of my team appear to be here today, so I'll try and answer. The, I'll try and see if there are any questions on the. Okay, so um, no questions from the from Zoom. So we have um, Ambrose, who's a, 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 a human wildlife conflict specialist from uh, from Laikipia in Kenya, um, who's a previous speaker. Um, a, a more general question, which I know I know you know the answer to, but do Asian elephants cause conflicts with humans? No questions from the um, so John, sorry, we can hear kind of feedback coming through from the Facebook Live. I think you must have opened it, but it seems to have stopped now. Yeah, sorry, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to keep it away. Sorry about that. Um, yes, my team usually read the questions for me, but they seem to have all disappeared. Um, no so yeah. So the question is, do Asian elephants cause conflicts to humans? Um, yeah, so I feel like any of us could really answer that question, but yeah, definitely in the wild, Asian elephants, um, there is quite a lot of human elephant conflict in the zones where the wild elephants and the communities live very close together, especially if they're planting things um, like pineapples and bananas and things like that, the elephants really like to get into the fields and crop read a lot. Um, but unfortunately in Thailand, there's just been a lot of deforestation over the years. The elephant habitat has diminished a lot. And that has meant that there's just not as much space as there used to be for the wild population here in Thailand. So unfortunately, yes, in the wild population, there is a lot of human elephant conflict. Yeah, so Ambrose, it, it, it does happen, but these these were um, these are captive elephants who have been released back into their natural environment and uh, and are overseen during this time by their mahouts, by their handlers, um, and yeah. that's why that's why how you manage to keep conflict down, much as the same as we do, except we also have a river. Um, that's how you manage to keep the conflict with your neighbours down, and again, um, very much a lot more community involvement, I believe, up in the mountains with your with the with the Karen villages that surround you, who are. Who are not averse to elephants moving into their crops from time to time or, or less averse than some of our neighbors so um yes it's it i mean definitely you'd see um like if throughout the village you would see the elephants just um like being escorted to certain places and you know like you said like the village was very much um susceptible to the idea of that that was something that was like part of their normal life so they they didn't mind it at all and of course um like we mentioned in their study um during the cold season they were allowed to go into the fields because it was just past harvesting season and so then they would be able to go into these fields um with the supervision of the mahouts but in the seasons that it was um that we were they were cultivating um corn rice or any of those things they were strictly taken off the path making sure that they never went into the fields because you got to think that this is their livelihood um and so they want to protect it um but as well sharing um the field access to the fields to the elephants whenever um they weren't not being used yeah all right thank you um yeah um zach asks and you've got the right slide up as well so the plant parts of plant consumed the numbers the percentages don't add up to a hundred percent can you talk us through how that uh that calculation was uh how that calculation was done um i'll let Isleen answer this but i'm pretty sure the reason is that quite often there was an overlap between what the elephants were eating so sometimes they would eat the leaves and the stem at the same time, or um, they would eat the fruit and the bark at the same time. But um, Aisling, is that correct? Is that what you read into? So yeah, so pretty much, uh, can you hear me? Sure, yes. Okay. So um, yeah, so just pretty much what Carrie was saying, um, it is um, kind of a variable, um, just as you can see in the video, um, I think it was like two slides uh, before this one. Um, it sometimes the visibility was very low and so um we would kind of had a, had an idea of what the elephant was consuming kind of like the plant species we'd be in the constant communication with the mahout and sometimes all at the same time the elephant decided to break off the root eat the root eat the stem eat the lift all of that at the same time so i think that's kind of what's going on with the numbers um so just the, there was an overlap in all these things it's because you gotta wonder with the visibility it's kind of hard to see everything that's going on and especially sometimes you know we'd had to move very quickly, um, follow the mahouts, follow the elephants because they were, you know, on the move for sure for the next um, food or the next thing that like appealed to them for sure. 
and it's nice flat open territory where you're working as well isn't it um, having been there no <laughs> It's <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> that's, that's a good one. That's a good joke. Yeah, no, it was definitely a lot of climbing, a lot of trees, leaves, everything hitting your face, a lot of sliding on the butt and everything like that. Um, so um, that's a very good joke on your part. Sorry, um, yeah, I, I didn't make clear. I was joking. It, I, it is, um, you, you must have got very fit. It's extremely mountainous territory up there. Okay, Rene is asking, um, were there plants that were preferred but took more effort and time to acquire? So um, I did mention this previously. Um, so um, I think I'm gonna go back in the um, in one of the slides, but I think just to make it um, kind of, uh, to make an, an analogy of it, um, just, just bear with me if I, go way too much far off the path, go ahead, let me know um, that this makes sense. So bamboo um, was consumed quite a lot. Um, we said 44% of the time was spent consuming bamboo. So we can think of bamboo as kind of like the celery of what we eat, right? Super easy to eat, very easy to consume. There's not a lot of um, working out to cut it or anything. You can just pretty much um, eat it, right? And then we have the bark, which is not the easiest thing to acquire. It definitely takes a little time and work um, to peel it off the, um, the trees and everything. And we can think that of kind of like the broccoli, the carrots and everything of what we eat. So while um, we can eat the celery all we want and make ourselves full, we also need, you know, the, um, the broccoli, the carrots, the cauliflower, all those things for nutritional value. So the elephants did just the exact same thing. So they were like, let me just eat this um, I guess celery and art part. So let me eat this bamboo, fill myself up, and then I'll make sure that I'm looking for the nutritional values in the other parts of the plant. So yeah, so we did see an increase and in, in depending on the season as well, there was an increase of things that they were particularly looking for um, in opposed to nutritional value. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, very nice analogy. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Zach is asking again, so the elephant's diet had twice the variety of those in Nepal and Myanmar. Um, why do you think that would be? I mean, I think uh, uh, for one part, I think um, our research study was conducted for a long period of time. Um, it, so it, it, it it, it allowed us to, you know, have more samples to collect. I think that's one of the things that needs to be noted. Um, and of course, I think, like I said, um, location is everything. And so in other um, studies, they saw that grass was one of the biggest components, like in India and in Myanmar, I think, um, where the one of the biggest components was grass. Um, so that's pretty, um, you know, it, it's kind of relative to that. So I think seeing that our plants, you know, um, we had a lot more vegetation, a lot more things. Um, and, you know, like we said previously, um, kind of hard places to go into and to um, look at the elephants. There, were, there was definitely way more um, plant species to identify. And of course, I think the longevity of our study, I think that probably is the biggest contributor to as, as to why we saw more species and more families within those species. Yeah. Perfect. Yes. Um, Rene also asks, did the ages of the elephants affect their food choices at all? So just going from our observational studies, we didn't do any kind of analysis of, on it for this study. It, uh, from what we've seen, it does um, seem to have an effect. So the older elephants, especially the ones that have been in the forest for longer, knew more about the forest, they knew the areas to go to, they knew the plants that they should and shouldn't eat, whereas the younger elephants would quite often just watch what the older elephants would eat and kind of follow them or, you know, Tume or May Doom would pull down like a lot of food fodder and all the elephants would gather around and eat that, that the food that the ladies provided for them. But as they get to stay in the forest for longer, the quicker that they get more confident and are able to find the food for themselves. Yeah, that makes a, a great deal of sense. Um, so Rennie, Rennie's um, inspired, I think. So what were the six main species of dominant food sources in your study? As in, I guess, species rather than uh, types of plant. One second, pull that up. I'm gonna um, really butcher these names. I really am. Um, so I'm sorry so um, to any botanist. I do the that, same. That's in the podcast because I, I really, um, 
not my expertise, but just give me a second to pull those, um, to pull that data out. Um, so we, um, the elephants, um, consumed for 36% of the time consuming plants of the post CA family. Um, and so that, um, you know, 12% of the time was foraging the time and the majority of the time was due to the consumption of bamboo. We also saw, um, uh, you know, in, including the rice, which is the, um, excuse me, the ori sativa, the CMAs, which is the corn. Um, we saw... A lot more that I just cannot pronounce, and you, you're going to have to excuse me on this one. Um, you know, I, it, it's not it's not the easiest names to pronounce here. Just just just, just go with it. Thank you. We we don't mind. <laughs> very very yeah. informal lecture. We won't yeah, we have it. the dendrocallus, which is bamboo. Um, yeah, so it's it's, it's just a, a a big variety um, of names that I cannot pronounce, but of those include um, you know the. Um, excuse me, the Fabaceae, which is 30 species, the Poceae, which is 19, the Mauraceae, which is 10, the Rubiaceae, which is 6, the Anacardiaceae, which is 6, um, the Lydaceae, which is 4, the Aposanide, um, 4, the Phyllotisea, 4, um, Euphorophia, 4, um, the Vitaci, 4, um, and um, a few more, a, a, a few more, way more um, that I will just be butchering. Um, so if um, I think maybe it's a, a better to look at the um, at our paper because I know I'm definitely butchering these names and I you probably can't understand what I'm saying. <laughs> so I like to apologize for that. That's yeah, we can idea. put a link to the paper um, on the comment section after. Okay. Yes. Perfect. If if you can do that, I also have a link somewhere as well. Okay, so Wendy is asking about what happens at night. So I guess it's a general elephant management question. Uh, do you use uh, do you use the twenty five to thirty five meter chains and or roaming areas the same way as we do here, or do you have a, another approach um, when your mahouts are sleeping and not able to be watching the elephants? Yeah, so as you said, the elephants do need to be confined at night time. Um, it's just not safe for them to be roaming around and not safe for the mahouts to be looking for them in the middle of the night um, due to the amount of fields and roads and villages, et cetera, in the area. So yeah, we do have very long chains for the elephants at night time so they can still forage, still socialize and have enough space for them to sleep, et cetera. Perfect, thank you. Um, yeah, very similar approach here. Um, so uh, Kun Sang Ling asks, were any of your 165 species non-native or invasive species? Um, I no note some of them were crops, but so uh, other than the crops, were there any invasive species? Actually, our elephants really love the mimosa pigra that, that grows on our land. Um, did, did you notice any more? I don't think it was noted in our study um, if there were some of the invasive species. Um, uh, it, it was not something that we were um, you know, keeping track of. So, um, you know, I, 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 I would not be able to answer that question for you just because I feel like it wasn't completely noted um, if they were, um, that we did send him out to a botanist in Chiang Mai and he would be um, the one that would categorize the plants that we were identifying. Okay, great. And there's a follow-up, a similar question that, that leads on to this um, is the question um, was, with the elephants, with the elephants, with the with the plants that were left unidentified, um, what would be the reason for that? Was it that you weren't able to collect the samples, or the the botanist just simply didn't know what they were? Um, a bit of both. Oh, sorry. Um, I'll just go into this a little bit. It's a little bit of both. Like sometimes we're not able to identify it. Sometimes the botanist isn't able to identify it, and sometimes we just haven't sent it to the botanist yet. So we usually will. Um, kind of line up a bunch of samples and then send them off all together at once because you know we're five hours away from the city and that is where the botanist stays so we can only go in to give the botanist these samples every so often um so yeah it's a bit of a mixture of both we're going to get more samples i need again soon once we have enough to give to him yeah um i'd also just like to add just because i did some of the um collection of this data sometimes what would happen is you know 
either the the whole plant was consumed from the elephant so leaving no trace behind other than just uh, maybe a leaf and that just wasn't enough um, um it was completely like totally destroyed so we wouldn't be able to identify it or grab a sample um so that's one of the other things that we had to keep in mind that sometimes there was just no sample left um or it was kind of like you know stepped on you know, destroyed or something. And so um, even if we were to acquire a sample, um, it wasn't something that the botanist would be able to identify. Yeah. Perfect, that makes sense. Um, so I think no more questions on Facebook and um, none from the Zoom. So Aislinn, Kerry, brilliant work. Thank you very much. As I say, it's a subject very, very close to my heart. And the one thing that really shouts out to me as someone who's been hanging around and helping manage and managing Asian elephants in captivity for for probably 20 years now is just the 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 need for elephants to have access to their natural habitat um, in the way that that you do and we're just about beginning to manage ourselves and it just underlines that that if you're keeping elephants in in one place and giving them three different food types and that's all they have access to um, that clearly isn't enough for either their physical or their mental well-being. I think similar to us, we, if we ate the same three things all the time, we would be thoroughly bored and obviously would be missing out on nutrients and everything else. So thank you very, very much for the for the paper, for doing the work and for allowing us to um allowing us to to learn this and to be to be able to use this in a way when we when we suggest how other people should be managing the population. I try not to suggest that when I'm asked to advise on how other people can manage uh, their captive elephants. Uh, one quick question before we go, sorry every, everybody in the audience, the papers in India and Myanmar and, uh, and everywhere else, uh, were they on free roaming captive elephants or were they on wild elephants? I'm not too sure. I think we'd have to look them up. It might be a little bit of a mixture of both. Okay. But yeah, okay, we cool. need to double check that. Yeah. It just suddenly dawned on me that, that that might also be an important factor. I can look it up as well. So I'll, I'll have a look later as well. So all that remains really is for me to say thank you very much for you both. It's a, a great work, a fantastic presentation. Um, are you got are you a kindred spirits currently open? Can I send guests your way? Not right now. Our community is still too worried about the spread of the virus. Um, so we okay. can't accept people right now, but we definitely will in the future. Hopefully not too far in the future. Hopefully not too far for, for the sake of for the sake of everyone. Well, in that case, I don't feel guilty in saying if you'd like to come and see some elephants free roaming in their natural habitat, please do come and see us. But as soon as kindred spirits come open, go up and see them because they're obviously doing fantastic work up there. Um, and it is an absolutely beautiful setting that they have. It's stunning up there in the mountains. Um, I will come and visit you. I've never visited you guys. I've been up to a few of the, the villages there. So I will come and visit yeah, you as soon welcome. as I can. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so yes, do go and see Kindred Spirits as soon as you can. Uh, great work going on up there, obviously. And please do keep up the research work. Congratulations on keeping up the research work and when when the uh, all the other work has cut down, because I, I know how difficult that has been um, from personal experience. So fantastic and congratulations on everything that's being done. Um, if you do happen to be in Chiang Rai, do come and see us at Anantara Golden Triangle. I'm sitting here in their beautiful lounge, slowly warming up um, outside the elephant bar. I can see some free roaming elephants down there with one of their friendship groups down, down in the grassland. So you can come and do that, as I say, if you have the chance, go to Kindred Spirits as well. But this weekend, come to us. Um, and so I've got, to, got to get a word in from my sponsors there. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, please do join me on the lockdown live stream at 4 p.m. this afternoon or at 7.30 tomorrow morning and we'll keep going. Um, it's always every day and you get to see you. I don't go into enough detail in what they're eating, but you do get to go and see what the elephants are choosing to eat when they, they walk around the place. And sometimes we are we are left stunned by the sheer variety. So um, oh, oh, we've got one more chat. Oh, just a thank you from Sasha. Okay, thank you everybody. And we will see you very soon. Kerry and Aislinn, perfect job. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for having us. No Thank you so much. When you get the next paper out, you'll have to come back and present that one as well. <laughs> no worries. <laughs>